Rob Austin. I'm one of the owners and brewers here at Burnham Brewing Company. I'm Steve Burr. I'm also one of the owners and brewers here at Burnham Brewing. And could you tell me like the, the genesis of how this all started? Go for it, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I mean, we all started as home brewers. We were uh, falling in love with the craft scene that was slowly, uh, quickly growing in our area. And uh, you know, we started all, uh, really got going from us going up to Greenbush. It was like the big starter when they opened up in 2011. We were started going to their tap room and trying all their beers. Um, just uh, brought out the homebrew equipment after that. Uh, kind of just dove into writing recipes. And started making some really wild stuff right off the back. Um, yeah, I think it's because we were brewing different things and we just saw, you know, the industry changing around us and we were like, man, these beers are really good. You know, why aren't we doing this for a living? And we kind of grew from there with the love of Greenbush. Steve eventually got a job over there and now we go. Got a job growing up there, and uh, we kept doing our homebrew thing, and we were, didn't really have a name yet. We were kind of, we were planning like going down the road. We'll eventually maybe, maybe open a brewery. And so we were writing our recipes and naming them, and you know, doing that kind of thing. But uh, we, after Greenbush, uh, planned on upgrading to their big system, to, from a seven barrel to a fifteen. They offered us the seven barrel system. We told them we wanted to start our brewery one day. So it's huge. Yeah. It's, which was kind of a jump start for us. We didn't expect it. And I got, oh, we don't have a place or anything. So we bought some of the equipment and put it in storage until we kind of found a place to get, got, you know, build a brewery. The original, like, five of us that were, like, the home group here was myself, Rob, my brother, Blake, uh, Zach Blackwood, and then uh, Danny Moser was one of the other guys. And the five of us really were really Homebrewing a lot. Yeah, it just we started. We all lived in the house together. Yeah, this was a, it started as a bunch of homebrewing, you know, and then other people were interested in it, and then they started coming over, you know, our buddies that were interested, they started bringing some ingredients we would need, and then all of a sudden they were brewing with us, and it, it's just a lot of fun, and it's uh, kind of got addicting once we started doing festivals. That's when it really picked up when we did the Blue Chip Festival for the first time, and we went through five, six barrels in an hour and a half. The hype was there after that. I mean, everybody was on cloud nine. And we kind of knew what we had to do after that. Yeah, so we ended up uh, purchasing that Greenbush equipment. And then so now, all right, now we need to find a building. So we were searching for one for a bit. Then we, my uh, brother, my sister, and I owned this building that we're currently in. And it was a retired construction company that we had up for sale. And uh, we decided up to take the construction company, uh, you know, take the building off the market and start building here. So we just. Uh, so is everyone from the area? Yep. Yeah, yes. we all went to high school together. Um, we're all in the same graduating class. Mine's Howie. Uh, he's a grade below us. Yeah. yeah, we all went to Newbury High School. It's over. It's kind of like country school, the little northeast of LaPorte. Yeah, we all lived in LaPorte, Rolling Prairie, New Carlisle area um, growing up. But I mean, uh, here in Michigan City, I went. I used to live here in Michigan City for like the first half of my life before I moved out to that school. And then my parents had this building was our family construction company growing up. And then after uh, my dad passed away, we shut down the company. We were going to sell the building, so we took it off the market so we could start uh, building the brewery here. We just kind of tore into our own construction. Uh, didn't really have a great plan, and we were way over budget, way over budget multiple times. <laughs> We did a lot of the work ourselves to save money and ended up building this. Now, were you guys like beer aficionados from the get-go? I wouldn't say beer aficionados. I would just say we really loved trying new stuff. You know, I mean, it's there were so many new beers coming out, and we not only wanted to try the new stuff, we wanted to experiment with them and actually brew with them. And we all like cooking, so it's like kind of like cooking with liquid. And it was, you know, finding what ingredients worked at what times. You know. Do some better than others. Yeah, weird, crazy giving stuff that like make so, people love it. I wouldn't <laughs> say any of us are like brewmasters. They're like you know Cicerone, you know, certified or anything like that. We just really love making different product and making a really good consistent. We're different still product. learning. Yeah, we're still learning every so, single day. So. Yeah, we've done smoke pork chops and we've done Texas brisket kind of beer. And, but that was a collaboration with the Texas brewery. Yeah, some of the weirdest things we've ever done. Like, there is really no limit to how weird you can get. I mean, there's some things you probably never want to see in a beer. And well, some of those things we put in a beer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Squid ink. 
for yeah, example. Yeah, squid ink, we've done. Um, we've done French onion soup here, which literally tastes exactly like French onion soup. Yeah, we've caramelized like onions cold for French onion hours. soup. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've done... We're about to do a beer with hemp yeah. flour. Uh, uh, Fruits are any kind of fruit you can Always think of. possible. Yes. Yeah. There's just no real limit. There's spices, there's coffees, so there's... Yeah. There's things that we have, and there's a whole list of things we haven't even used yet. So I mean, I feel like we have barely touched the surface of what we can do. Do you find that people are receptive to that experimentation? Oh, yeah. Some people, you know, you get, you get some people that, like when they come into the tap room and see you know, something outrageously weird, like smoke pork beer on the menu, some people will shy away instantly from that. But there is yeah. there is the, the general curiosity of the like, basic person that will always want to try that weird thing. I think uh, one-offs will always have a place in you know the brewery industry's heart because one-offs are something that you could say is never going to happen again and people just are attracted to that main fact right there. They might not even like the ingredients in it but they're going to try it. You know they might have a maybe just a sample of it but you might like that sample. You might buy a pint of it. Some people would come in and tell us the French onion soup beer is the best beer they've ever had. Other people would say it was the worst beer they've ever had. Yeah, <laughs> there are people getting it to go the so I mean, be a chef thing, but yeah, it's it's just <laughs> different. Everybody's palate's different. So the fact that we're so varietal and that we just brew so many different kinds of beers really works for us and works for our distribution as well. Because you know, hundreds of pounds, they want different beers. They don't want just being told that they can have you know one type of pale ale or one type of IPA. Like we'll give them four types of pale ales or you know that. Right. So it just it works beneficially for us and I think for the uh, the customers that are coming in are getting a different experience every single time. Well, we have our small batch brew system, our 15 gallon, essentially our home brew system still, and we're, we're able to do really weird things in small amounts, so we're not stuck with tons of one type of, you know, of like French onion beer. So we're able to put that stuff on the tap room, uh, tap list, and balance it with, you know, in a IPA or pale ales and like cream ale, and you have your basic stuff like that, so you have a good balance on the tap list where people can try the weird, and if they don't like it, they can get the norm. My name is Howie Wiesgen. I was one of the originators with uh, the rest of the seven. Um, we all kind of went our separate ways after high school for a little bit. I uh, went to school down at uh, Butler University, studied some biology down there, um, got a decent uh, background for that. Actually, while I was down there, I wanted nothing to do with yeast, um, honestly. But uh, no, when we got back, we started throwing around the idea of the brewery and um, we all kind of had our niches. Steve was a good, great brewer all, so far, just uh, getting the recipes down. We all kind of, like I said, we all just kind of picked our niche and uh, stuck with it and started growing up the, the brewery, um, making strides every day to make it more efficient, more, um, just more uh, quality. Um, a lot more to do with uh, packaging, um, the fermenting process, overall quality control of the fermenting, um, and then that also includes uh, counting the yeast, making sure we have the proper amount of yeast for each brew, um, make sure it's not too much, not too little, so we get the exact results we want, whether it's growing up the yeast or propagating it up another tank. Um, I use microscope here and uh, count it out on my hemocytometer um, through a series of dilutions and stains. And that way we can tell, number one, is our yeast any good? And number two, exactly how much we need to use to actually make that batch exactly how we want it. When I was in college, I had no idea I was going to do anything with brewing. Um, I thought it was neat. I had some friends who homebrewed. I homebrewed a little bit. But it was mostly like the Mr. Beer and like starter packs with extracts and stuff like that. Um, literally, when I was in college, we did a yeast study and you have to check on your project every four hours uh, throughout the night, throughout the day, so middle of the night you have to wake up, walk across campus and check on this yeast and I was like who the heck would do this with their life? Like why would you devote your life? This just seems silly and then after the fact um, as I went farther down that rabbit hole um, learning more and more and how actually interesting it can be and uh, yeah I mean when we got back and started throwing together this uh, idea of starting up Burnham, it just kind of seemed like a no-brainer where, where I could fit into the project. So right now, I'm just sterilizing these over here. Uh, these are our stir bars. They're magnetic stir bars. Um, so I use these 
in the various uh, Erlenmeyer flasks over here, or even the uh, six gallon carboy I have going here. This is for a larger batch of beer. So basically I'm providing constant aeration and movement of the yeast, so it's providing an exponential uh, growth, basically, for the yeast. Um, so instead of it taking, let's say, five days to grow up, get to the right concentrations, I can do it in about 48 to 72 hours and have even better growth, healthier yeast, ready to go when we need it. And what's actually in there now? Uh, right now, it's, um, it's actually a lager strain uh, from Omega. Uh, growing it up for, we're going to be brewing a Maibach on uh, Monday. So um, right now I just have a simple beer wort made up just of uh, DME dry malt extract. Um, the, just a nice light way to get maltose into the water. Brewed up a tiny little small batch, transferred it here into the carboy with my stir bar underneath. And uh, once I get it to the right temperature, pitch in the yeast. And then that's when the propagating begins. Over here we have a uh, just in brewing you have your clean side and you have your you're not your funky side as we like to call it or sour side. So over here I built a homemade little uh, incubator, uh, just a styrofoam box and a uh, reptile heating pad with a thermostat control on it. And I can take a, we make up our own house culture of lactobacillus for our uh, kettle sours. Um, so I can just uh, brew up one of those small batches into the 5 liter Erlenmeyer, cap it off, throw in my uh, grains that I need for the propagation, throw it in there for about 2 to 3 days at um, about 105, usually it's a safe temperature, I mean it is homemade <laughs> so you don't want to go too high on the temperature, but uh, no, yeah, and that's uh, keeping that separate away from my clean side um, uh, yeast is definitely important though because just cross contamination you, you never you never want that. <laughs> Typically Steve and I are the two um, that are allowed to touch the funky sour stuff just because that's the biggest problem some of these other breweries have with cross contamination of getting unwanted bacteria or yeast mixed in with your clean side yeast um, it can it can take down a, a whole brewery realistically. Um, so keeping track of who's actually in contact, when they're in contact, knowing that they know the procedures of how to keep it contained is very important. Our souring process took a while just getting the right ratios, the right pH levels, um, and actually working by, I work behind the bar sometimes as well, uh, seeing people's reactions to it um, kind of let me gauge how far sour or tart I should go to based on my pH, like when they drink it in there that's too much I think <laughs> like especially when it's a sour level lover um, I mean other people they hate sours they really do and that's fine but just to get that gauge where it's tart but it's not just like I'm overwhelmed with with sour yeah, you want to be a warhead or something right like exactly but some people might love that some people do and I mean we do have our variety but like for I'll be the same is one of our cans uh, can sours we do that one we wanted just tart like kind of a little bit more tart than like a uh, uh, the Oarsman is another common uh, sour uh, out there in cans and that's almost what we modeled it after. It's a nice uh, light Berliner Weiss, nice crispness and just good tartness but not like you said like the warhead attacking your, <laughs> your senses. Yeah, you're <laughs> How's it going? Uh, I'm Matt Zakreski. I am one of the co-owners over here at Burner Brewing Company. I uh, do the marketing, sales and events. It's a collective team effort, but uh, those are the uh, that's what I got my hands in as far as hands in the cookie jar go. Um, so I uh, actually, quick backdrop, I was going to move out to North Carolina and pursue my marketing degree, and then uh, we started Burna Brewing in 2013, so now I'm here and uh, playing the role on the majority of the business side. But uh, still brew every now and then, still create some recipes just because uh, it's, it's hands-on, you want to be able to talk about it. And uh, yeah, that's a quick little blurb about me. My name is Zach Blackwood. Um, I am titled right now the Director of Operations, but that's just kind of a bogus title. I just do a lot of different things that I can't exactly explain. Um, I got involved with Burn Brewing at the get-go. 
um, knowing Stephen Blake and having some experience in hospitality and management in general, um, I was able to assist with some some of the startup procedures and then was just um, involved with it from the start and just kind of rolling with the punches at this point. It kind of feels the same because uh, the attitude's the same. The interact the day to day interactions haven't changed much, but there's just uh, you know we've we've put a lot of effort into. Growing our product, um, we've learned a lot about the business aspect that when we started it was like, oh yeah, we can just do this, this is going to be great, it's going to be fun every day, so, you know, quickly you learn that no, it's not, you know, you're kind of a victim of your of your circumstance in that you, uh, you know, stuff has to get done, um, you know, it's not all fun and games, it's it's really hard work and the line between failing and succeeding is very thin, uh, but, you know, your product is, is very important, um, product quality, but there's a whole bunch of other things that need to be done. Um, to even get that product into people's hands. Um, so, you know, like day to day, we're very focused on improving and uh, uh, making ourselves more efficient and um, just kind of working on long term goals and short term goals that, you know, at the start we, we just didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. You know, I think that's that way with every business though. Man, failures, it's hard to say there's one in particular. There's so many. Um, you know, we've, we've failed at a lot of different things, but we've persevered, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, you know, some of our product wasn't coming out the way we wanted to. Um, we've had we've had bad days where, you know, we've had batches go down the drain. We've had um, been product go out that we weren't happy with. We've had uh, all sorts of stuff, but we've always made a commitment to, to the quality, and I think above all, you've learned from your mistakes and you develop. Um, you know, to get into, we have a very long list of failures, to be honest, but I think that's something that um, you can only learn from, and we, we try not to make the same mistakes twice is the most important thing, uh, but, you know, even sometimes that happens, but we learn from every mistake, no matter how. We've always made a commitment to quality, so I think we're at the point now where we really feel comfortable um, making more of it. Um, what I'd like to see is we want to uh, continue to get our product into the hands of people in the best way it can. We want to get, you know, hoppy beers as fresh as we can to people and sold before the sell-by day. You know, we want to continue to improve our barrel aging and our specialty process so that, you know, we know what we're getting ourselves into and at the end of the day we can deliver the quality product. And, you know, as long as, as, long as we can continue doing the same thing um, and getting beer into the hands of consumers that want our product, um, you know, whether that's growing our customer base or whether that's making more product, you know, I think that's where we'd like to see it. You know, I don't really have a number on growth because it's more important to you know individual interactions the right people getting the right product i guess